Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this live event and we'll be talking about ask what you want to know about influencing. So this is really your event, this is the opportunity to ask any question to Owen and myself. My name is Giuseppe Conti, I'm a negotiation and influencing professor, a former procurement executive and I have the pleasure to have with me my colleague and friend Owen. Owen Derbyshire, who is a negotiation professor at Oxford. And but we'll get in, to know him a bit more. But before we do that, we want to know a bit more about our audience. So how about telling us uh, from where you're connecting? You know, to get us started, let's get an idea about uh, our audience today. And then, of course, you know, we will be looking for uh, your questions we'll be looking we want to understand you know what you want to know what's led you here are you just here because you want to listen to other people questions or you actually have your own doubts then you know take advantage of the opportunity right you know so yes uh, and by the way hello hi tony thank you for joining hi, and we have uh, Tony from Switzerland, we have Cedric from France, beautiful Lyon, and of course, you know, we will be happy to address any question that you may have, and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, we get to see also, uh, you know, what is leading you to, to come and joining us here. So let's see how the event goes now uh, we do have also a few questions that have already been uh, uh, prepared to send to us up front you know some of you have sent the question up front which is great uh, and then you know as we continue to move on with the the question then uh, we will uh, we will uh, then move to the question from the audience. So first, you know, before we open up with the questions, uh, let's uh, start to get to know a bit uh, our special guest today. Owen, uh, would you say a few words about yourself? Hi, Giuseppe. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you and with uh, uh, everybody else as well. So uh, thanks for inviting me onto this. Um, my name is Owen Derbyshire. I'm uh, English, uh, as you might be able to hear, but I've spent uh, plenty of time in in other countries. Um, I've been a professor at Oxford for about 28 years or something of that order, um, where I focus uh, and have done for a long time on uh, negotiations. I did my uh, PhD uh, in the States. I spent some time living in Germany as well uh, and often take a very international perspective uh, to, to what I explore. Um, I live just a little bit outside Oxford with um, uh, multiple dogs uh, somewhere in the house, so I just got to hope that they don't uh, end up barking too much at some point during this uh, in this session. Fantastic, very good, Owen. Perfect. So, what I suggest to do is, you know, let's start with the question that you raised uh, during, uh, you know, in the event as we publish the event, so that you you ask so you send some question up front, and then we start taking the questions from uh, the audience. So let's get started. There was a question that was raised by uh, Regina, and uh, here is the question that uh, was uh, was in the, when having an influencing conversation, the selection of words and the messages plays a, a significant role. How can people overcome the disadvantage when speaking English instead of their mother tongue? Or when you want to kick it off? Okay. I mean, I, I think that one of the um, useful things for us to do during this sort of session and this conversation um, is to sort of you know, challenge in a way the way that people often think about influencing and persuasion and negotiation. Because usually it's uh, the most important thing to reflect on is that negotiation, sorry, that, that influence and persuasion are uh, about a process, they're not an event. They, they, so, so they don't take place in one sort of conversation, if you like. Um, it's it's through usually through multiple conversations, through building a relationship, through building uh, trust. And in 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 that sense, um, you know, I think that as you build a relationship with the other person, as you build 
mutual understanding of where uh, each of you are coming from. Um, the uh, challenges that one of you might face sort of in terms of language um, probably likely to play less of a role than you might imagine, okay? Now, one of the reasons for, for that is that most of the time when we communicate, we believe that people are pay, playing, paying precise attention to the exact words that we use. And actually, that's not really true. Most people are trying to get the gist or what's sometimes called the fuzzy trace of, of the message that we are giving. People tend not to remember the specific words that you're using. Uh, they tend to uh, remember the, the broader message. Um, so the first thing is, you know, just not to worry you know, or to get too focused on specific words, but think about the focus of, of that sort of, you know, broader message, which is formed in the context of a, of a relationship that you've got, so, so that you're uh, developing that uh, over, over some time. The, the, the one other thing to, to think hard about, I, I, I think probably, is that most of us spend too much time when we want to influence or persuade somebody focusing on the words that we are going to use in to, to try to persuade the other person. In other words, we're very outwardly focused. You know, it's from me, I'm going to make you change your mind. Um, and that sort of notion that it's just about getting you to change and that it's not about an interaction, um, I think leads us to um, uh, misunderstand or uh, the best ways of influencing people. Uh, and the best ways of influencing people are to engage more in, in a conversation. We can talk more about this as we go along. Um, uh, so, so, so that's that's another thing. Think about the other person and the dynamic and the interaction, the questions you're going to be asking them, because a lot of it will be not just you telling them, but asking questions from them. Lastly, just very briefly, I guess you know, you, you've got clearly got here in, in this notion of different languages, but then different cultures are going to play a role. Um, and I think you have to be sensitive, not just to the words, uh, the, the specific words that you're meaning, but how they're interpreted in, in different cultural settings. And we can come, I'm very happy to come back to that and to explore it further. Fantastic. And I think, you know, let me reinforce, you know, one of the messages, you know, when, uh, when Owen and I are teaching together and we do it, to, we, are, we are doing it since uh, 2018, so it's now the, the seven years that we are, we, we are doing this together. And uh, uh, we indeed, you know, look at influencing as a medium to long term process. So we are not so much focused on uh, one of persuasion you know the guy that tried to call you and sell you something and wants you to buy a new you know internet subscription for for your phone but for your for your computer for your home or your your phone or whatever but we are more into you know how do we make it indeed you know how do we establish an effective process and uh, uh, building also what uh, owen was saying about uh, you know, not so much focusing about what we say, the research indicates that the things that makes us more efficient to influence others is acknowledging what, how they see the world and asking curious questions. So let's uh, reframe our mindset about, you know, I'm going to choose the right word that is going to make them tick into having the right attitude. Now, if we go into the language element, there is one element though where I want to add an additional spin now, and, uh, I, and that's from personal experience, certainly speaking with a neutral accent makes us more persuasive. You know, and uh, you're just comparing two examples here, right? You know, Owen speaks with his beautiful Oxford accents and immediately sounds very good. When I talk with my accent, then inevitably there is at an unconscious level an impact on the credibility of the message. So certainly one of the things that we try to do is mitigate our accent whenever we have a strong one. 
by the way, continue to have a strong one, but certainly better than the one they had the 10 years ago. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so let's uh, let's let's get to the second question that we get from our readers, uh, and then you know we I see that there are also question uh, from our audience. So let's. Uh, I'm trying to influence my boss to give me a promotion. Any advice on this? All right. Maybe. I can kick it off. Uh, okay. As you as know, before being a professor, I've been in a corporate environment for uh, over 25 years. So <coughs> I have some real life experience on this. And, uh, you know, the first thing that comes into my mind, but uh, are you sure that is really your boss, the one that you want to influence? What I mean, you know, depends, of course, you know, on the kind of setup. Now, if you are in a family-owned company and your boss is the owner of the company, then, of course, you know, the boss is the decision maker and everything, right? But uh, if you're working in a multinational company, like uh, a good number of the people that are joining us, then uh, it's really your boss that decides about your promotion. Maybe sometimes there is even a conflict of interest, you know, uh, from real life experience. You know, if you are uh, the most performing person in your team, in, in the team of your boss, and a promotion will move you to be at the same level of your boss, maybe there is a conflict of interest there because they will end up losing the best contributor of their team. Of their team. So they may know, even though, of course, you know, they want to have a good relationship with you and keep the things, they may not be so motivated to give you the promotion that you deserve. Now, I think, you know, a good piece of advice is uh, manage your multiple stakeholders. You know, so make sure that, yes, your boss, certainly you need to have a good, if you want to have a promotion, uh, the approval from the boss is going to be uh, one of the core elements, but somehow, you know, make sure that you get exposure to your N plus two. Maybe there is an indirect functional boss, the general manager or whatever, or maybe the HR director has to give also his approval to the promotion or whatever. So you have to make sure that you manage all your key stakeholders and maybe, you know, you use your network, you know, to talk positively about you. I mean, uh, it may well be that uh, one of the person with whom you did a good project play tennis with the N plus two, and then uh, or real tennis like Owens plays real tennis. And then you know, if you are play, if they're playing tennis, maybe you know at the end of the tennis match they can casually mention how successful was the project that you done together or whatever. So that when the idea of the promotion comes then uh, there is a whole network that uh, is supporting you. I don't know when if you want to add something else or if you want to move yeah. to the next I mean, Just to pick up a couple of things there. Um, I, I mean, I think your, your, your emphasis on, on sort of, you know, stakeholders and networks is absolutely uh, critical. I think it's just worth you know, just rephrasing that it, it, to, to sort of say, the, the thing to remember, go back to the idea that this is about a process, not an event. Uh, so this is a longer term uh, element of managing this. Um, managing up is the, one of the things that is forgotten so often. Uh, we, you know, the, the idea is that I'm going to be managing down. I'm going to be looking at uh, sort of making sure my team do well or whatever. I'm looking after my job. Half the time, your boss has got very little idea. They've got their own concerns. They don't really know how well you're doing at various things. Um, and, and make sure that, you know, that, that notion of managing up, of making sure that they understand uh, how, how, what it is that you're achieving, making sure that other people above above you, above them, also manage, uh, as, as Giuseppe is saying. So it's a constant, you know, don't wait till the, you want the promotion before you start thinking about this. Start thinking about this well in advance. And this is true with your networks uh, overall. You start thinking a long time in advance. Um, and, and be clear on what criteria you think the uh, promotions are typically given on. And as you sort of start thinking about those, start building up the credibility you have uh, for that promotion. And so that's thinking, you know, 
further down in advance, making sure you've got the right network for the next job uh, and the next tasks that, we, that come with promotion. Um, but if it's you, you should have a particular set of projects, uh, a set of particular set of experiences, um, then try to make sure that you've accumulated those by you, what you're doing is effectively managing to give yourself the opportunities uh, so that when those that when the promotion uh, decision comes around, you actually it's all well understood. Fantastic, Owen. Thank you. Let's take uh, the other question that was uh, in uh, in our pipeline of the question that uh, our audience asked before the event. We do have also lots of questions from our audience, so. Let me take one more question from, uh, okay. When being at early stage of building a relationship with stakeholders, what words to use to maximize the influence and what strategies to influence subject, specific subject when at the beginning of the relationship? Well, I guess I guess we 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 with with the we danger. Cover, we cover some. We on. cover some of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so don't uh, sort of you know focus too much on 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 the words. You know, think about this over time. But but as Giuseppe was saying earlier, yeah, think about this as being sort of you know um, not just outwardly focused. It's not just me imposing this upon you. This is sort of technically known sometimes as the deficit model of persuasion. The deficit model seems to sort of say. Um, uh, if I want to persuade you, you would believe the same things as me, but you lack something. You lack the right information. You lack the right understanding. Um, all I've got to do, therefore, is explain something to you, uh, and then that will get you to change your mind. And that's not really the way that or any of us tend to get persuaded. When I've got a particular view, I don't feel it's just because I lack the information that you have. It's because I believe it. And if you start trying to push your ideas upon me, the chances are that, you know, as you, as you try and push something on me, my natural reaction is to resist that. Um, and, and, and I put up barriers. Uh, so just trying to push something on somebody, uh, particularly, of course, you know, early in a relationship when you don't know the other person, can, can actually be counterproductive. Um, and so, you know, what you can do instead of just trying to think about using words, actually think about, turn it around. What questions can you ask? How can you help the other person sort of really un under sort of stand, um, you know, what you, how can you understand them? How can they understand you? Engage in a dialogue. Um, and, and, and the deeper that sort of conversation can go, actually, the more likely you are to have a productive uh, foundation for, for being able to persuade them. And in relation to the sort of the strategy, um, well, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the challenge is that the strategy is going to be, you know, very, very context dependent. And part of that's about your relationship with them. Um, again, Giuseppe used the word uh, credibility earlier. You know, credibility is often made up of the combination of trust and expertise. Um, and, and the strategy that you've got, if you've got high credibility, if you're trusted and you perceive to have expertise, is going to be different than if, if you are not perceived to have those. Uh, so, so actually, some of the time, uh, you're, the, the, the strategy you're going to have is building up trust building up their understanding that you've got expertise. And again, go back to something else that Giuseppe mentioned before, your network. You know, if I can, if, if Giuseppe knows the person I'm trying to influence and can say, actually, Owen's really good at this. He's done a great job elsewhere. Then all of a sudden, I'm perceived to have both expertise, but if you trust Giuseppe, then you're more likely to trust me. So, you know, it's, it's through multiple different, um, uh, angles that you should approach this. Fantastic. You know, let me build on what you said, you know, adding some, some perspectives, you know, uh, we were talking about, you know, the tendency that we have of pushing our approach. Let's say, mm. if in general principle, we have two types of strategy, you know, push energy or pull energy, you know, and, and most of the people may have a preference for one of the others. And, uh, you know, when you are negotiating externally, maybe 
with the push and energy, you can still get away, right? You know, especially if you have power, then you use your push energy and you get what you want. Now, if you are dealing with internal stakeholders and your tendency is to push, you know, which means, you know, persuasion, asserting and those kind of things, probably you're not going to build the right relationship with your colleagues. Um, now, if I look also at the specific point that uh, I read in this question, um, you know, the influence the specific subject. I think, you know, when I look at the specific subject, one that comes into my mind is the idea of understanding the person you're dealing with and look at their peculiarities. I mean, are they a people person or are they a task-oriented person? Do they like detail or do they like, uh, you know, general concepts? And then, of course, you know, that's one of the things that a good influencer will do once they build this uh, knowledge about how the counterparts operate. Either you build it through the interaction or maybe you build it through your network in preparation ahead of an important influence meeting. Maybe I'll add one more thing about at the beginning of the relationship, right? You know, one of the things that we often neglect is making a good first impression. We may go into meeting an internal stakeholders and then we go in and say, well, uh, I'm Giuseppe, uh, good morning. Um, yeah, uh, I want to talk about, and then, you know, you're already starting on, on the wrong foot. So, in fact, you know, your image inside the company is going to be a combination of first impression because people struggle to change the first impression. So going in with a strategy, you're going to make first impression is also important. And by the way, a simple one, appearance. You know, there are a number of studies that have shown how the appearance has an impact on uh, how people are perceived. So just it doesn't mean that you have to be the next uh, Marlon Brando or or uh, or David, uh, Brad Pitt, but just you know making sure that uh, you are uh, properly dressed, that uh, your t-shirt is ironed, the shoes are clean, and uh, if you're a woman, that you have you know the right level of jewelry and an appropriate dress, and that's you know goes a long way in helping making a good first impression. Okay, now just you know, there is one point that uh, I would like to do before we move to the next question. I just want to talk for a moment about something that Owen and I will be doing soon. And uh, because uh, on the 18th and 19th of June, Owen and I will run uh, our traditional masterclass. You know, we have been running for several years a masterclass today, the topic of this year is influence and persuasion. So if the topic of influence and persuasion is appealing to you, how about taking this opportunity to come to join us in Geneva the 18th and 19th of June? We will be at, uh, we will be at, uh, at Geneva Airport, at the Hilton at the Geneva Airport. So there is a train station next door. There is an airport next door. So, and in fact, we have people, last year, we, the farthest away was from uh, California. The participants farthest away from, from California, but, you know, we have people also from Africa coming. We have people, let's say, coming from different European countries. So we do hope that you'll be able to join us. And in the chat, you find the link. Uh, there is one more news that uh, uh, we have uh, a special rebate until the end of the month. So if you sign up until the by the 31st of March, then you can get the masterclass with 30% off. And the rebate goes, can go up to 40% if you come with a couple of colleagues. So check the, the link on... Uh, on the on the chat and then you will discover some more about the masterclass okay so let's uh, let's go there was one more question that uh, was coming our way maybe owen we should try to be a bit faster because there is a lot there are lots of questions coming through so 
I'll, uh, I will try to, to go a bit quicker. Okay, let's see. I'm working in procurement in a company with high profitability. As a result, most of my stakeholders do not care much about cost. How can I influence them to be more cost conscious? Now, if you don't mind, though, I'll take this one because, uh, you know, I worked in procurement for uh, over 20 years and uh, having worked in pharma, by the way, you know, that looks like uh, a fairly familiar kind of topic. Now, a quick advice on this one. If you do have stakeholders that do not care much about cost, probably you want to find other ways to make the project happen but which resonates with them. At the end of the day, they want to do it because they want to reach their goal, because uh, they will do the project because of what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. So if you want to get more stakeholders to work with you on cost reduction project, you should not call them cost reduction. Maybe their project about risk mitigation. Maybe their project about uh, increasing our innovation capability. And uh, then they're more likely to resonate with uh, your stakeholders that they, they may not be very cost conscious. I don't know if you want to add something or we move to the next one. Uh, let, let's 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 move on. I might pick something up as we go as we go forward. Yeah, because there are quite a lot of questions on the pipeline. So let's 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 quickly go for there, Cedric. Uh, indirect, indirectly influencing. What are your feelings on the best proportion to have? Mm. Very interesting question, actually. Um, and and I, 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 this is going to sound a bit of a of a, of a cop out to say that it depends upon uh, the the nature of the relationships that that, that uh, exist in this, but in the context that you're talking about. Um, you know, there, there will be situations in which actually uh, you, you need to deal directly with the counterpart that you're doing in a negotiation or an influencing session. Uh, and, and there are others where actually you don't have, for example, a good relationship with the, uh, with the person that you want to uh, engage with. They don't, you don't have enough sufficient credibility. Either they don't know you, you're not, they don't perceive that you've got expertise, in which case, Case, you've got to say, actually, is there a third party? Is there somebody else that I can bring in that is actually going to be able to be uh, more influential with them? Uh, in which case, you might well be doing this indirectly with the by, via the, the support of others. Yeah. And then, you know, something that, uh, that builds on this one, you know, um, sometime... Uh, this uh, this external reference may also come in the form of uh, you know using uh, objective arguments you know saying well you know listen this is mm. something that uh, uh, has already been happening uh, in uh, company xyz as reported uh, but you may have read the financial times uh, that this is what's happening this kind of things and then you know is a uh, is a way you know to strengthen your message without uh, directly having to boost your your own uh, uh, idea but uh, you make the message go through indirectly yeah yeah no I mean, just to pick up and, and this picks up at what you said uh, a little bit before uh, Giuseppe which is the uh, notion of of um the you can use you can try and use sort of facts for example you can build your factual argument which you can try and impose upon uh, the other person um and as i said before that often generates resistance people that also don't remember facts um you know if you and, and the evidence on this is is extremely robust you know if you just present people with facts they don't engage with it in the same way and they don't remember it uh, after a short time afterwards if you actually present this as a as a story of an issue that is being dealt with elsewhere then people with stories people engage in it in a very very different way and partly that's because stories are less threatening to you they're less they're less imposing upon you they're also somewhat more you know ambiguous they're less clear but that means that people funnily enough can I interpret the ambiguity themselves and 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 that actually helps 
give people the space to change their mind uh, because they appear to be doing it of their own sort of you know, free will, if you like. And that's an important thing to remember when trying to influence people. You've always got to give people the space that they're not just acceding to you, that they are sort of trying to understand why this is a good thing themselves and to get to it, you know, not forced into it. Fantastic. Let's move on because we have a lot of questions. So maybe we'll we'll answer them a bit more quickly. But you know, let's let's go. How do you deal with the stress of influencing people and remain positive when working in the space? This could be in preparation, during, and post-event discussion. If influencing is not always a skill that comes easy to people. Hmm. Well, I, I just very let me just say a couple of things very quickly, and then I'll pass over to you, Giuseppe. But I, I think one of the things is that um, when when we feel stress or, or when we find something difficult, we imagine that people are looking at us um, in a in a you know almost a very very critical way, um, and and that they are constantly sort of you know judging those very small things that we do. Um, and actually, we, we are really bad at, in, at understanding and interpreting what other people think about us. Uh, we think that they are, you know, you, 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 there are lots of very interesting or fun experiments that people do with this, you know, getting people to wear silly T-shirts and imagining, you know, are they thinking negative things about me? And most of the time, they don't, they haven't noticed or they don't think negative things. Um, so... So it it is a it is a um, some people are better at, at influencing, but it has to be said that it's something that we can all practice and we can all engage with and we can all improve. Um, but don't imagine that even people who are skilled at it find it um, an unstressful interaction. But take comfort in the fact that actually, uh, if you present a a broad message or you engage in a conversation with people if you ask people questions a fantastic way of beginning to influence people is to ask questions to show that you're inquisitive and interested in them um, and that conversation is something that we can all uh, readily do um, uh, and and once you do that, actually, you can be much, much more successful in drawing people down the, the, the path that you're interested in. Yeah. Let me add on this uh, Angela Merkel strategy. Angela Merkel's strategy was uh, preparation, right? You know, in order to be more confident about, you know, the kind of files that she was dealing with and the kind of uh, uh, influencing challenges that she had internationally is, you know, being extremely prepared and this helps you to uh, give you more confidence. And then, of course, you know, as uh, Owens mentioned, the practice. So even joining a workshop, you know, getting the opportunity to practice, getting feedback from people, understanding what are the things that you do or less well, is certainly something that helps you and give you more confidence in approaching uh, future events. Let's go to Mario. I feel sometimes people misplace influence you for manipulation. I love to hear your thoughts about it. What are the main differentiator aside of intent? In, well, if I may, I would say that actually intent is the primary differentiator, right? At the end of the day, whether you're doing something which is good for me and good for you, then we are into the influence space. If uh, I'm going to try to do something which is good for me and not good for you, or really good for the company, let's say more in general, right? You know, maybe, you know, if there is a tension between two functions with opposing interests, but we are recommending something which is the right thing for the company, then we are into the influence space. So uh, I would say that's the kind of mindset we're trying to get something to do something which is good for them. I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I do think it's about intent, and and there are lots of ways. Uh, you know, with, there's a whole massive literature now about sort of um, uh, 
cognitive biases, for example, and and the way in which you can, uh, if you like, exploit cognitive biases uh, in the way in which you present information. Um, or I can tell you now that if you if you want to influence people, one of the uh, great ways is is what's called the power of the default. So if we're going to have a meeting, um, I can set the agenda for the meeting. Um, and, and, and I can do that because once the agenda is set, it's more likely we're going to discuss the issues that I think are relatively more important. And that's likely to impact the outcomes of this. Now, I can do this without actually um, uh, seeking to um, undermine you. I do it cooperatively with you. Look, look, let Mario, let me help you. I know you're very busy. Shall I just draw up an agenda and I'll send it over to you? Um, now, there is going to be an agenda. Um, I'm going to use it to sort of to, to sort of influence the, the nature of the discussion, but I don't have to do that with an attempt to manipulate you, which I think implies that I'm trying to do you a harm. Um, you know, I, and, and there is no neutral framework for, th for this. So we just have to be aware uh, that, that, that there are multiple tools that we uh, that, that, that are inevitably there and some and we have to use them in one way or another. We can do it consciously. We can do it unconsciously. Yeah, fantastic. Let's go to the next one. What do you think of alternative influence factor like managing of open policies? Not sure, uh, Owen, I understand the term uh, open policies. If you do... I'm afraid I maybe... don't, actually. No, sorry about that. Uh, but it would be great if you want to, if you're able to just expand on what that open policies is with a quick text, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay, we don't want to go into yeah into the wrong direction because we we, we misunderstood the, the the question. Okay, so I mean you still have time. You can you can do some more. Let's see. Okay, okay. Let's see. next one. Cynthia, how do you present your expertise and knowledge while still being humble? It's not my strength. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Giuseppe, Giuseppe, you've got so much to be humble about. Uh, <laughs> I, it, it, um, there, there is, of course, you know, let, let, let's just uh, be clear. There, there is a there is a cultural element in this, and 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 we and so just just be aware of that element. Um, that having, for example, self-deprecating humour, which might be sort of a way in an English culture of of, of actually trying to uh, show that you have got a lot of expertise and and, and so on. Um, in certain Asian cultures, that self-deprecating humour would be perceived as a as a very strange thing uh, because it would actually send exactly the opposite message uh, of of and, and, and why would you ever undermine yourself so so there is that um uh, element uh there um and so so it, it, it's sort of you know we need to be sort of sensitive about that um but i i think that you know some of it might be you know sort of telling the stories that you uh, of the of the experience that you've got um, and, and doing this in a way that it doesn't always have to be about you, but it can also be about your organization. Um, and, and so it's sometimes it's balancing the team that you've worked in, your organization, uh, and you personally. Um, and, and you know, some of us, you know, perhaps this is a, a, in, in your sort of mind, Cynthia, some of us react again, you know, sort of somewhat negatively when you see people having, you know, claiming sort of just the most absolutely extraordinary accomplishments, uh, which would be, you know, that these people would be ruling the world if they'd really done all of these in, in a small amount of time, uh, but, but where they've actually been a member of a, of, a, of a project which has achieved something. So I think it's that balance of where um, the, the credibility actually, if you like, is attributed to. Yeah. And uh, Owen talked about... Uh... Uh, country culture, you know, the Far East. Let me also add the gender piece here, right? You know, research indicates that uh, mm -hmm. more often women feel uncomfortable 
to boosting their expertise and knowledge. You know, you feel, uh, you know, you yeah. feel, uh, you don't feel so easy. Yeah, a man will not hesitate, you know, to to consider himself better and to uh, ask for more and to consider that they're great. And uh, maybe a woman is less reserved in uh, 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 expressing those things so maybe it's also a piece of work that you may want to do on yourself now if I look at your name I see that you have your name and family name then you put CSPCP you have a couple of images with uh, one indicating growth so somehow even in your LinkedIn job title you are indicating somehow that you are uh, you have qualification and you're able to deliver results so I think you're on the right track Cynthia <laughs> Now, the time is flying. It's already 42 minutes that you have been talking. So let's take the last question and then we call it a day. What is the best way to influence a very busy stakeholder who can have a very small time to listen to you, but with whom you have several projects to work with? Mm hmm. I, I think I think the, the, the challenge clearly is that you've got to be thinking how, how are you going to make the other person interested in what it is in engaging with you? Um, you know, and, and, and that's the challenge. You go back to what you know Giuseppe was talking about before about Angela Merkel, but others as well, preparation, right? You know, take your time, think through carefully, you know, what is it that this individual is, is interested in themselves? How can I actually make this attractive to them in a very, very quick sort of uh, pitch? Um, and, 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 and target it to your, the, the depth of understanding that you can get about them. And for example, if I can link this to uh, the, the individual and go, Look, I know that you've had this sort of really interesting project before. I think you might find uh, this interesting in a similar way. Linking it back to something that they are familiar with so that they want to engage with you. So it's the framing, if you like, of the of the of the interaction and the conversation that you're ha that you're having. And once they've decided that this is uh, something that might be worth investing in, uh, even a small amount of time, then you're on to the next uh, step. Yeah. And, and let me share a real life story that builds on what Owen said. You know, for the last 20 years of my corporate career, I always prepare the agenda of the meeting with my boss. Right. You know, because. Uh, I will then, you know, okay, there is a limited amount of time that we have. Okay, let me set the right priority. Let me make it relevant for them and let me shape it in a way that will encourage them to dedicate the time. It will make them more willing to spend more time on this topic. So start reflecting on it. Choose your battle. Maybe you have, you know, eight projects and it may become too boring to go through eight projects. Then you choose the one. Just listen, this week I want to talk with you about three, just three ones. Since you prepare them well, you are concise to the point that the message is clear and you, you know, then you, maybe you give them a couple of options and they make the decision and then you can move, quickly move forward to the next steps. Well, I think, you know, we said this was the last question. And by the way, we love the interaction with you today, right? You know, there were very good questions, very different one from the other. And uh, I think, you know, it was a pleasure to spend some time with you. There is one more thing. If you want to spend some more time with Owen and I, why don't you come and meet us personally? Why don't we spend a couple of days together in beautiful Geneva in the summer and then almost summer, you know, 18, 19 of June. And then, you know, we're going to have a follow up program together with six webinar videos, uh, live events, uh, article, etc. that will follow you over two years so that you can really master the art of influence and persuasion. I hope you will be able to make it. The link to the masterclass is in the chat. And we currently have a 30% off until the end of March and 40% off if you bring a couple of colleagues. So check it out and uh, thank you for being with us today. And we wish you 
a fantastic day. Owen, thank you very much for being with us today and uh, for sharing your expertise. All the best. Bye-bye. And see you all.